Okay, welcome to another episode of The Fundable Founder. I'm here today with David Zamorin with Debt Repel. Um, welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me. That's great. Well, uh, we've known each other for a few years now, and I think you've got a really interesting story uh, to tell and share. But first, tell us a little bit about your business. What's the uh, elevator pitch? Yeah, sure. Detropel is a protective coatings company. We specialize in all types of PFAS free coatings, which just means that we don't use any cancer, cancerous chemicals in our products. Um, we essentially create products that you could spray onto almost any surface and it could repel any liquid based uh, substance to keep your stuff clean and stain free. Pretty easy to understand, but the, the key concept there is really PFAS free, right? That's what Correct. makes you unique in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. We're the, our claim to fame is that we're the only PFAS free protective coatings company as a whole in the world. Uh, any coatings that we do, whether it's for textiles or for food packaging or even outside like stone and brick and concrete, uh, which you wouldn't think <laughs> people would even care about if it was PFAS free or not. Um, we're still committed to being fully PFAS free in everything that we do. And why is that important to you? Well, frankly, it's, you know, it's a major problem in the industry, right? 99% of humans' bloodstreams have uh, PFAS related chemicals, uh, at least in the U S and, and that's, that's a really concerning issue because a lot of these fluorinated chemicals are incredibly dangerous. And that's what you've seen with some of these multi-billion dollar lawsuits against the, you know, the bigger companies like DuPont, uh, 3M and Dow, where, you know, they've been penalized for literally having like the, the poor community in Virginia that, you know, where 80,000 constituents all had cancer from the drinking water because of PFAS related chemicals. So it's, it's a massive problem. Wow. Uh, so take us back several years, you know, why, why did you decide to become an entrepreneur and why, why follow, you know, why, why launch this company? Yeah, I, um, I was always entrepreneurial from a very young age. My parents uh, are both immigrants and my, and they got divorced when I was two. And so I was forced to live with my grandparents because my mom was working, you know, 17 hour shifts in retail. Whereas my father uh, was always involved in business. He was more on like the real estate and, and financing side. He was a stockbroker beforehand. So I wouldn't call him necessarily an entrepreneur at the time, um, but he was a, a businessman. And I think there's a big difference between the two. And uh, yeah, it was, he, you know, on his side, he always, always brought me into the office, brought me to meetings. I was like six, seven, eight years old. And I, I couldn't understand it for a long time. I was like, I, you know, I hate being here. <laughs> uh, why am I here? But eventually within like after I remember I was like seven and a half or eight years old, I remember something just clicked and I, and I realized I actually loved being at those meetings. And um, I always had this weird dichotomy because my mom always, and my mom's side of the family always pushed education. So I was very, very motivated to become a, a high performing, high achieving student. But at the same time, I had this knack for, doing stuff with business. So I started like my first thing I was selling pop schools that my grandma was making, thinking that I was giving them out for free to my friends in our apartment complex. When I was like five, <laughs> I was selling them for like a quarter of pop. And then we would go to the dollar store and I'd buy these toys. And I thought I was, you know, my parents, my grandparents had no idea where the money was coming from. I, I think they did, but long story short, they act like they didn't. And um, yeah, I was always entrepreneurial. And then when I finally got into my high school, I went to a public school, but it was a magnet school, one of the top schools in the country uh, in Philadelphia called Masterman. And when I was attending the middle school there, I was still selling things. I, I had my first business, I'll call it, where I was selling popular headphones and watches at the time, which were Beats and G-Shocks. Uh, and I made like 10,000 bucks in one summer, wow. um, just selling them at flea markets as a fifth or as an incoming sixth grader. So that to me was a ton of money. And I, I split it with my dad in half because, you know, seeing as he was my investor, he gave me the first hundred dollars I needed to start the business. Uh, he definitely got the better end of that deal. Good um, angel investment but, on his part. Yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. But I ended up, you know, always having these entrepreneurial tendencies. And then when I got into my high school, I realized I was so nervous about getting into Masterman. I was thinking, well, on paper, I'm the same as all my other peers, all the other, you know, students that were at the school. We all did you know, sports year round. We all were academically gifted. We, we all did like 10 clubs and were state champs and everything that we did. And so on paper, I, I looked identical to everyone. Mm. So I got really nervous because I said, wow, I'm, I was this concerned about getting into a high school. How's it going to be when I'm applying to college? And so I started thinking, trying to think outside the box. And luckily I, I remember like it was yesterday, one day 
in uh, Spanish class, we got this flyer for a youth entrepreneurship program that was held out of first round capital. And I jumped on the opportunity. I interviewed and I was the only, there was only 20 people out of like 3000 that were accepted. And I was the only one that wasn't a senior from oh, wow. high school. I was the only, I was the youngest kid by far. I was four years younger than everyone else. Um, but I also took it the most serious. I, I thought that entrepreneurship and it was just becoming a hot, you know, buzzword to throw around and being an entrepreneur. Um, but I, uh, I, I fell in love with it. I, I, I ate the whole thing up. I ate up all the mentorship we had. The, the amazing thing about that program is that we had three or four new mentors coming in every session. And there were like three sessions per week, um, two to three sessions per week. And I went to every single one. I showed up early, stayed late. Uh, I was fascinated by first round capital and, and everyone else. And then more importantly, I was fascinated with the mentors that were coming into this program. Uh, and the tagline was start something real. And, and they taught you that, you know, an entrepreneur is really just solving problems uh, to everyday issues that they were having or others are having. And my biggest issue at the time was that I, when I got into my high school, my gift for my grandparents was 200 bucks. And I used that 200 bucks with another 200 bucks that I had. And I bought my first two pairs of Jordans. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I was very, um, sentimental about those shoes. I hated getting them dirty. So I wanted to come up with a film that could be peeled off whenever it got dirty, but I didn't know anything about, um, I didn't know anything about chemistry at the time. So we, I got this opportunity. Some mentors recommended that I pivot the idea to a shoe cleaning company. And at first I, you know, I, I had a little bit of pride. I was like, I'm not going to clean shoes, but <laughs> the reality is I swallowed that pride and I, and I did end up cleaning shoes. And we pivoted that idea to actually clean shoes for local university sports teams uh, for all of the sports teams that I could find at Temple University, Drexel University, University of Pennsylvania, LaSalle. Um, and so we, we ended up having, having a, a pretty good business, actually. I was a solo founder and I was making 25K a month and it was crazy wow. high margins. Wow. So that to me was like a ton of money again. And I was a freshman in high school. So this was, the, I, I had more money than I knew what to do with at the time. Uh, even though, you know, in today's day, I, you know, it's not a ton of money, but, <laughs> but it, nonetheless, it was a lot. And I got an opportunity uh, to sell the company four months into it. One of the business development people I had hired uh, saw how the business was growing. He was moving out to California and he wanted to grow the business there. So he offered me uh, a deal to sell the company for pretty much just a royalty fee and a little bit of money up front. And I took it because it was a no brainer for me because my real passion was the conditioning service that we were offering, which we didn't actually have a solution for. We were offering this solution, call it, uh, that we would spray your shoes with a product that could then repel all types of liquid-based stains. And at the time it was a competitor of products of death repels. Um, and so I waited to get that product for like four months. It cost 1600 bucks for a little quart. I had to buy a full body suit and a respirator mask to apply it. And I didn't know why. And they were just so back ordered that four months into it, when I got the opportunity to sell the company, I called them up and I said, Hey, are you guys ever going to deliver this order? Right. <laughs> and they're like, unfortunately, it's just so small. We don't really care about it. Yeah. Um, and so I canceled the order and I, I sold the company. And that summer I started researching green ways of coming up with the Lotus leaf effect, which is effectively what a lot of these nanotechnology textile companies do or textile companies. I, I can't call all them nanotech companies because they're not. Um, and then I started looking into nanotechnology and that's when my research really started formulating and, and kind of coming together. And I was fortunate that, you know, my high school offered advanced chemistry classes in 10th grade. I took those. Um, but more importantly, I also had uh, an opportunity to be a part-time undergraduate at the university of Pennsylvania. My school had this awesome program where if you, if you qualified, which every kid at my school did, uh, you could take classes at Penn at the same time that you were in high school. So evening classes for real college credits, this is with other undergrads in the program. And so I did that for three years and I, and I did my studies on actually I did a few different things. I did global politics, I did economics and I did chemistry. And particularly I reached out to the Sink Center for Nanotechnology, which was a brand new facility and uh, reached out to the leading researcher and got some direct mentorship from her. And that was kind of all she wrote. I started doing research and eventually that's how the initial formulation came about for Detropel. So you, you're a self-taught chemist who came up with the formulation <laughs> to solve a problem that you had as a freshman in high school, keeping your sneakers clean. Yeah. And to be fair, I did have to hire outside labs while I was doing all sure. this. So it wasn't, you know, entirely me, but the concept and the, uh, the core technology that all stemmed from me. And then eventually as we hired outside labs, there were other proprietary portions that came into it. Um, 
all the way up until now where we are today, we're actually synthesizing the advanced materials. And that's what makes us so different is that we actually make our own particles and our own technology. It's incredibly unique. Wow, it's an amazing story. And um, I know there's even more to come because there's you, you, you've had an interesting journey to, to where you are today. Um, so let's let's talk about, you know, you, you got the formula. Um, what, did, what else did you do to get your business off the ground before you went out to seek funding? Were there other pieces to the business you wanted to make sure you understood before you went and got funding? Yeah, absolutely. At the time that I started the company, I was 15. I didn't get funding for the first time up until I was 19. Yep. So I, you know, I initially, initially put in all my own money. I didn't want to necessarily dilute my equity shares. And, and at the same time, I was looking at constantly, I was always trying to find a co-founder for the company or someone that could be like a good technical advisor. Um, but I struggled because all my peers were either my age or in college. And I didn't really know too many older people. So I was constantly doing cold outreach to random people <laughs> that I could just find on online. And eventually, I think one of the things that came about was, you know, the first thing I did when I filed the LLC myself, I, uh, I then learned that, you know, I had to do an MVP. I, I went and did a bunch of surveys, like, like probably a thousand people um, of what they would pay for a product like this and so on and so forth. And eventually I got a few samples in that were uh, of a working formulation and I started selling that uh, and I got my first store. My first store was like a, a, a consignment shop for sneakers right next to Penn's campus. And that guy who ended up owning that store became a, a mentor of mine for a few years. And, uh, you know, he, he's kind of the first person that believed in the company. And from there, what happened was, you know, I, I just got some validation. And for me, all I needed was to get that first store, that first customer that bought more than like you know, maybe 50 bucks worth of stuff to really understand that this was going to be a real thing. And so by that time I was already, I had just turned 16 uh, and it was you know, like maybe I'd say six months after starting the company, I, uh, I listened to a podcast uh, or sorry, a video um, interview with Chris Frelick, who was a, one of the partners of First Round Capital. And he gave a conversation piece about how, essentially it was teaching how to craft the perfect email. The, the, the discussion was like, how to get a hold of the busiest people you know. And it was essentially a 10 step guide on how to craft the perfect email. And so I, I soaked it up, I studied it, I emailed him, he didn't know me at the time. He responded and in there I actually wrote, if I, if I understood your message correctly, you would respond. You respond, yeah. Yeah, and, and, he, and he did. And then I said, okay, cool. And I met with him, got a lot of advice from him. And then I reached out to Josh Kaufman, the founder of First Round Capital. Uh, who I, I was connected with through the youth entrepreneurship program. So he, I, he kind of knew of me and I, I certainly knew of him. So I expected an answer uh, and he did. He, he purchased some product. And after that, I realized, you know what, let's just go big or go home. And I taught myself at the same time, had a data mine and had an email hunt. So I, I actually found Mark Cuban's emails online, um, hunted them down and I emailed him and he responded. And that was the final kind of validation piece that I needed to, to really take the business full steam ahead. Uh, the only issue is that I, I had a ton of manufacturing problems for years after that. <laughs> so <laughs> what are you brought in house? I mean, you were a young entrepreneur kind of figuring things out as you went along, really educating yourself. You know, you, you have a natural kind of thirst for knowledge and oh, yeah. a, a real passion around um, entrepreneurship. But, you know, part of that thirst for knowledge, you must have gotten some good advice along the way from some of those mentors that really stuck with you and still stands with you today. Anything you can share with uh, aspiring entrepreneurs out there? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say all of my success could be warranted to the mentorship that I've received to date. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of, a lot of advice. I, I have way more mentors than I can count, but the reality is I, I keep in touch with them on a regular basis because I always learned something new. And I think some of the biggest pieces of advice that I got early on that really helped me was one, always follow up with everyone. Like I, you know, everyone I met, I always followed up with and I wanted to, to understand that, you know, for me, I knew that I was young and I was going to need help one way or another. And I, and I was, I was naive enough to think that I could solve this massive multi-billion dollar industry problem but I was also naive or, or I guess not naive enough to realize that I wasn't gonna be able to do it alone. Right. And so some of the best piece of advice I got was circled around following up 
getting additional mentorship, getting good advice, but also building a strong team. And that's the key component that I think I struggled with for probably four years into the company up until college. Uh, my sophomore year of college really is when I started building a real, you know, experienced team that had, you know, double the years I had alive uh, just in, in experience alone. And so that's when things really took off for me. But th- I think the biggest piece of advice I got was finding the right people that not only believe in the product and the company and, and you, but also believe in it for themselves so that they see themselves as part of the picture to be able to grow not someone else, like, you know, if you're a regular employee, you, you, I mean, you understand that you're working to make someone else's business grow. In my mind, I wanted to make it so family oriented for the company that I want the employees to feel like they're growing their own business simultaneously. And that was, I think, a big portion of, you know, why the team succeeded. Yeah, no, it, it, in, but again, you, you know, you were still young at this point and you're trying, you're getting people with experience um, to join you and buy into that vision and to buy, into the, um, you know, kind of that family culture, uh, that startup culture. I mean, that's gotta be a hard thing to do. I mean, how, how did, how were you able to kind of sell everyone on this vision and the idea of the culture? You know, it's incredibly humbling. I, I don't exactly know. I think the first two hires that we made that were like, by the time that we had launched in Shark Tank, I think we had five employees, but they were all college students, uh, including myself. And, right after shark tank within the first three months i had made my first real like 30 something year old hire (laughs) and that was my cfo because i knew that the constant thing that i was lacking as a as a founder for many years uh was the accounting side of the business Mm -hmm. i I wasn't good at that uh i didn't care for it unfortunately uh, at the time i I learned how important that is now but (laughs) someone a long time ago told me that accounting is your friend if you can figure it out it is your friend but i (laughs) agree with you it's it's tough to it's tough to to get into accounting if you're not into it yeah i I like the relationship aspect of of the business you know i I liked growing the business so for me it was hard to focus on the numbers and i and i had sloppy books because of that for for a long time but that's all cleaned up now no issues there (laughs) but that was my first that was my first real hire and that one, I think, was done. I, I think, you know, the individual that we found was just perfect at the right time. Um, Alexander Talabesa was the guy that we, we had hired. And he was, um, you know, a, a genius kid. He, he was a brilliant guy. Um, Excel whiz. Not, a, not a necessarily a trained accountant, although that's where his field, where his experience was leading in previous um, jobs that he had. But the reality was that, you know, he was kind of the first step into having a real employee. And from there, we hired our second one that was in her thirties. Uh, and, and then after that in the summer, I think was the first time that I actually had to really sit back and think about the team that I was building, uh, the summer going, uh, summer after, uh, shark tank. So it's summer of 2018. Uh, I had gotten into mass challenge, uh, the accelerator program. And I did the same thing. I got ac- early access to the mentorship list uh, looked at who I thought was going to be, you know, good mentor for me, uh, reached out to about 10 people. And right before I had reached out to one specific person, I had gotten a message from him because the mentors got an early access list before the, the contestants did. Um, so the, that specific person reached out to me like maybe 20 minutes before I was drafting an email to him. And, uh, he had reached out. He said, you know, I, I looked at your company on Mass challenge. I'd love to, you know, see if there's a good fit for mentor men- mentee relationship here and see what works. And that happened to be who now is my COO, Tarek. So we started hitting it off and Tarek lived in Holliston, Mass, which was where our original uh, warehouse was located at that time. Um, and I, and I offer this to everyone, whether old, young, doesn't matter. I, I don't care who it is. I always offer people free office space to work in our, in our facility because I always believe in a collaborative nature. And I think there's always more to learn from people that don't know your business that are outside of your business. So I offer him the same thing. I said, come work. You know, if you need a place to get away from your yeah. four young boys, come work here. It's five minutes from your house. No big deal. <laughs> and we just started hitting it off. And he heard some of the issues that we were having. And he you know, recommended a few different things and helped us set up a couple of uh, sales channels for us. And then from there, uh, we just, continuously hit off our relationship and and you know it, it got to the point where he actually approached me and said hey uh what do you think should i join the company and and we started the discussion and it, it was kind of almost a no-brainer for us so you know i brought him on and i gave him a, a nice stake in the company uh, to really help me run it at the same time and that's what i think that was the 
piece that legitimized the company enough because the next five hires after that were all these incredibly industry experienced people that I would have probably never been able to convince otherwise because Tara took the leap on me uh, for whatever reason. I still question it to this day. <laughs> his, his claim is that, you know, he's thinking that it's uh, that, that, uh, you know, he's getting early in with someone like a, as he says, early Elon Musk. I, I you know, I, I appreciate that comparison, although I'm nowhere close to it, but you know, he, that was kind of that that first step uh and when i got him i call him the first gray hair in the company he hates that (laughs) but uh you know as soon as we got him we hired you know in-house chemical engineers we started bringing everything on the operations in-house because today we don't outsource almost anything um and we brought in our cmo who was a former uh he was a senior marketer at rustoleum and then from there that guy introduced us to the former vp of uh, r&d at rustoleum who became our chief research officer and his wife uh, who both have 37 years of experience in chemistry alone. So all those things combined, I think that's what kind of made it incredibly interesting because people like Juan and Melissa are, are, are in two, our, two of our R&D staff. Um, they actually approached us and said, hey, we want to join the company. Right. We want to relocate from Ohio. Wow. That's where they were living. And so for that, for us, I mean, when that happened in 2000, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, that was like a, another game changer for me. I was like, wow. I mean, I, I don't understand why someone who's been in Ohio for 20 years is leading a, hun- a multi-hundred million dollar company, which was Dura Chemical at the time, uh, why he's willing to relocate. And, and, they, and they wanted to. They pitched us to come. That's amazing. And I think, I think the fact that they saw an innovative team, innovative culture, and just a, a family-like style of running a business that was so young, but so ready to grow at an exponential level I think that convinced them. And I, today, you know, to this day, I, I'm still incredibly astounded as to, you know, how we've been able to attract such a diverse and, and well-rounded uh, team that just is world-class, to be honest. Yeah, you've done an amazing job. And, um, you know, it's culture uh, and, and creating, deciding what that culture is going to be like early on made makes a big difference, right? And you're... Yeah. And, and, you know, you had a clear thought on how you wanted to do that and you executed on it. It takes time, but if you find finding the right people uh, to, to go on that journey with you is the, one of the most valuable things you can do uh, for your startup. Absolutely. And, and, you know, a piece of advice for any young founder is just remember, I, it took me like five years to get or four years to get to a real team uh, before any of this happened. Right. Like I, I struggled a long, long time, gruesomely. Just, <sighs> continuously finding hiring and firing the right and wrong people all the time. Like I, I struggled with, a, with it for a very long time to a point where I actually thought it was something with me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was the problem. Uh, and, and maybe I was, but at the time, you know, I maybe, maybe I didn't realize how important it was to, to lead with empathy. And uh, that became a, a big skill that I focused on in the last two years. And um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think ultimately any young founder, right? Like if you can find a co-founder, it's great, but don't be afraid to be a solo founder either and just try to run things on your own until you have the ability to bring on someone on your team and find that perfect fit for you. So at what point did you decide to go out and raise some external money and, and, and kind of accelerate the growth of your business? And what was your strategy around that? Yeah. So after I reached out to Mark Cuban, when I was 16, I mentioned that I was interested in going on Shark Tank because it was a dream of mine as a kid. I used to watch the show all the time. <laughs> uh, so he introduced me to a casting producer who followed my story for about four years. And in 2018, uh, sorry, summer of 2017, I had applied to the show. I finally said, you know what, let's do it. This is the time. Um, so I applied. We had gotten accepted on, uh, which was a gruesome process, but we got it. Uh, and I started pitching other angel investors because I figured, okay, what, what if things don't go well with the show, with the investors, what if I need to raise additional capital to, you know, fund inventory in case that the show part of it goes well. And so I started thinking about that in advance and I I got a few angels. And of course, you know, once everyone knows you're going to be on Shark Tank and angel investors who aren't like, you know, uh, venture capitalists, they, they get really excited about that. They want to jump on the wagon. They had the fear of missing out, obviously. Um, and so I had a bunch of people reach out and they wanted to invest. And two in particular, I took out of the four that um, were on the table. I took two investors, I raised 100K and that was going to cover the inventory that I needed for, for Shark Tank. And so I did that. Uh, then I went on the show and I did strike a deal on air with Mark Cuban and Lori Grenier 
Um, but that deal ultimately fell through. And for us, it kind of ended up being a perfect, perfect scenario because we had the money to pay, pay for the inventory. We bought the inventory and then the episode aired the first week of January in 2018 we had made like 300 K within the first month. It was like, it, it, it was, it was a, it, just on our website alone. I mean, that was like, we, we did like hundred K the first day uh, on our website. It was, I mean, it was, it was a lot of money and it was, it again, validated the company validated what we were doing. And at the time, you know, the brand was nothing compared to what it is today. And the packaging was awful. Um, so we improved a lot. And um, yeah, that's when I realized I needed, you know, the capital at first. And then in 2019, um, we hit a, another peak where we were like, okay, we, w- we want to grow exponentially now. We, we've built uh, the R&D component of our business or, or the technology component of our business. We want to we take this to market again, but in a much, much uh, better way, in a much bigger way. And so we raised a million dollar seed round from some angel, institutional angel groups uh, here in Boston and in Philadelphia. And we deployed that capital immediately into growing, you know, immediately into, into deploying uh, efforts into sales and marketing and, and production. And we built up an automated filling line and that proved to be perfect timing. And timing honestly is everything because then COVID happened in 2020 uh, in March, when it really got big here in the U S uh, we had just gone our in March, literally we had just gone our fully automated line in here and we were a protective coatings company that was looking to add complementary products at the end of the year being cleaners and disinfectants. So we had already started researching that technology and we rushed development to get that to the market and within a few weeks in, in April, we had a product to market with a disinfectant that ultimately, you know, took the company and, and grew us exponentially. That's awesome. Um, we're almost out of time, but you mentioned raising an institutional angel round. Any advice for entrepreneurs about, you know, working with angel groups and raising money from angel groups? Yeah, I have a few pieces of advice. And the first one I would say is, you know, you're going to have to reach out to a lot of them and don't be discouraged when you get passed on or you get certain advice that isn't in your favor. Um, because unfortunately with the angel groups, especially some of the larger ones, like a Boston Harbor Angels or a New York Angels, you have a lot of different members in the group that have a lot of different opinions. And I'll give you an example. I pitched Boston Harbor Angels in the summer of 2019, uh, and we had an, a phenomenal pitch. And fortunately, you know, they held their pitch, pitches, monthly meetings or whatever at Babson's campus, and Babson has a heavily, heavy involvement with BHA. Um, and I had a fantastic reputation at BAPS and that was kind of the, the marketing piece for the, four, for the three years that I was there. Um, and, and, you know, I, I got a great recommendation, great reference to BHA and, and that pitch went phenomenal, got great questions, answered them wonderfully. And, and the due diligence went smooth that following week I had pitched the Cherry Hill or Cherry Stone Angel Group, um, which is a, a group out of Rhode Island, which has the same demographic identical to BHA. It's, it's the same type of investor, same industry. Everything was pretty much carbon copy. And I got the exact opposite in mm. feedback. It was, it, you know, they, they, they struggled heavily with the concept. And, um, you know, we got some pretty harsh feedback from that, from that meeting, but ultimately we ended up raising. And so, you know, a, a few pieces of advice I could offer is one, you know, don't get too discouraged when you have differing opinions, because honestly, a lot of the times, especially with angel groups, they're throwing darts at a board, right? And they, and they have some sort of, belief or formula as to what they're doing. But the reality is a lot of time it's just based on who you know um, mm. and being able to convey the proper story of what you're doing. And so I think that's the, the thing with, with angel investing is that it's tough. You're going to have people that are completely, you'll have a meeting, you know, 30 minutes up, apart from each other and give you two completely different opinions and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is okay. And you ultimately want to find investors who believe in you and believe in the vision anyway. And you're not going to be a fit for everyone. Um, you know, so even some of the best companies out there got passed on by a lot of investors, oh, yeah. uh, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> along the way. So you can't get discouraged by that and just got to realize that it's, it's about those relationships that you build and, and the trust you can build with the investors. And then once you have that, then you can go on that, that journey over the next five, seven, 10 years of, of growing yeah. the company together. So, um, exactly. I, I like to, this has been awesome. Uh, your, your story is amazing. Um, you, the, you. everything you've done at, at Detrapel has been, has been great. I've enjoyed knowing you for several years and watching your growth as well. Uh, I like to finish by asking one question and that is how would you describe yourself in one word? Oh, uh, <laughs> I would say, um, intellectually curious. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I will, we'll put a hyphen in there and, and we'll call <laughs> it one word. Uh, but I agree with that. Um, David, good luck with everything. And, and I look forward to watching your uh, development over the coming years. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for having me. To innovate, invent, and disrupt, we're your partner to fuel your growth. Contact us to learn more.